as a, the result of my uh, talking a little uh, slower and not as loud is my wife and I have picked up one of these things our two and a half year old grandson gave us. So uh, we've been down, but I really wanted to be here. So I, I, if I'm flat in my affect, it is not a reflection of the enthusiasm for which I have for all of you and being involved in this. Um, sadly, we have till what time? Till what? Okay. Um, so the I think this <coughs> sort of it was helpful to come around the room see that all of you have some awareness of mediation and, and then um, most have some awareness of peacemaking and yet you know I think we're always kind of going back and circling back around to think about that and how we might use it to better our community and certainly when I asked Belinda to come it's because what we've been doing is kind of so much around it's always good to come back and talk about where where we have been and where I think the opportunities are where we can go from here. Uh, I'm going to ask that Susan will help us on this first part because a lot of times what people like to refer to as the nuts and bolts, sort of understanding in a way that they can see or repeat, well, how does mediation differ from peacemaking, what does that really mean, etc. Um, Susan gave a presentation for us nationally. And we had a number of tribal judges, in fact, who were thinking of doing it. They said, wow, I mean, this helps me to understand. So I think that will be helpful. Um, after that, I really would like to go deeper, though, um, and have it open to more specific questions, because I've really been fortunate. This article that I gave you just came out. Uh, hard copies being published, I think, this week. But it talks about this. Um, when done properly, a respectful government-to-government -government relationship between our state courts and our tribal communities. And uh, there is tremendous opportunity in that relationship that's existing and that is building uh, for us to do um, things uh, cooperatively, concurrently, recognizing the differences, but all which have the basis to improve our community. So before we get into just these nuts and bolts, um, well, I'll let you do your, your part, and then I have some definite ideas where I'd like to go, Susan. So if you don't mind, you come up and you can kind of run through that discussion. Do we need the lights turned down? I don't know. You want the lights off? Oh, oh no, I was just... Um, wanting to change the... I can click for you. I don't know what the clicker is. Okay. If that's okay. That's fine. Okay. Just tell me when you want it, man. <laughs> so, um, this was a presentation that I did for a PC family um, conference back in October this year. Um, who were wondering the same thing. So it was with a panel of mediators and, and me, the lone peacemaker, on the panel. Um, and this was the topic, the difference between peacemaking and mediation. So these were a group of people who practiced in the area of child welfare. I work under Judge Connors um, as a referee on the child welfare docket at the court, in the juvenile court. Um, so some of these slides are geared a little bit more to child welfare cases, but they're, it's easily transferable to other cases as well. So. Um, the goals of the two processes, mediation is really there to resolve an issue. Um, and, you know, we always talk about increasing understanding and between the parties and self-determination and mediation. Um, it's, it's a little bit more of a negotiation, I think, than peacemaking is. Peacemaking incorporates the idea of, of course, resolving the issues between the parties and increasing understanding of self-determination. But it has the additional goals of um, really working to go a little bit deeper, and Judge Connors is going to talk about that, um, but repairing harm and healing relationships and the community reintegration into the community um, is important. And um, particularly with court cases, I think it's difficult for people, once they've been labeled by the court system, sometimes to reintegrate into their own communities. So peacemaking really works toward that goal as well. Um, 
as far as the facilitator, there's usually one mediator. So I know in the in the community dispute resolution um, program, there's usually two mediators, co-mediators. Uh, mediators are impartial as to the parties, neutral as to the outcome. Uh, the mediator really creates the structure. We always say in mediation, we're in control of the process. The parties are in control of the outcome. Peacemaking is a little bit more fluid. Um, there are one or two peacemakers who are the circle keepers. Um, the, media, the peacemakers are impartial, but unlike mediators, they're really encouraged to share some of their own experiences and thoughts more than mediators do. Um, we often say in peacemaking that the circle really takes care of itself, and I didn't know what that meant when I first started peacemaking, but it really does. I mean, the, the peacemakers are there to help guide the circle, and um, the parties really are able to maintain a lot of the values and the, the structure of the circle themselves. Um, and, and they, the participants really structured the discussions a little bit more than the parties to the mediation. Susan, can we ask questions now? Yes. So what does that mean to maintain the integrity of the circle? To really kind of keep the, the ground rules, the values, everything people agreed upon, the behavior of the parties mm -hmm. in the circle, um, to keep it on a level where people can continue to speak to one another with respect and um, parties will often remind one another of things that I find that mediators have to do with mediation, um, not the non-interrupting, and I'll get to that part. We also have a, a tool we use for not interrupting and peacemaking, but parties are really good at kind of just doing that and taking over some of the work that belongs to the mediator to keep the process moving along. The participants in mediation, of course, are the parties who have authority to settle the case, the attorneys, um, and I know those of you who have worked on some of the child welfare cases, there may be multiple, multiple parties involved um, in a mediation or a peacemaking, um, people that are associated with the case. It's not usually between two parties. Um, parties can bring support people to mediation, but as you all know, they all have to agree on who that support for the people or non-parties, their participation in the mediation, uh, whether they sit in the room or sit out in the hall or how that works. Peacemaking, um, it is not only the parties that are involved in the conflict, but peacemaking is built on the principle that um, whatever happened doesn't just affect these two people here. It affects really a, a wider group of people, which we call the community. Um, one of the things that we work hard in peacemaking to, in this community is to figure out what a community is because in indigenous communities it's very clear who, who's in the community. Um, in, in our community it can be it can be the family, it can be a church group, it can be uh, the neighborhood, whoever's been really impacted by what's going on in this conflict those people are usually involved. And that's something that we often use peacemakers for um, in our community, is to serve as community members when they're not circle keepers sometimes. Um, and yeah, we're talking about the additional people on the rest of the slide that come along with the abuse and neglect cases. Um, so mediation can be ordered by the court or the parties can decide to come to mediation on their own. The process is, that, as you all know, the mediators make an opening statement. Um, the mediator um, assists the parties in the negotiation process. The mediator is very active in trying to help people come to an agreement. Um, you know about all the questions we ask as mediators and so on and so forth. Mediation can be separate in separate rooms if it's not particularly if we decide that they would do better if they were separated. Mediators caucus, um, we don't do that necessarily in peacemaking. Um, usually parties sit around a conference table with a mediator at the head of the table. So there's more of a hierarchy with mediation. In peacemaking, it can be referred by the court, but when we have cases referred, we 
try to make sure that the parties, that they're not feeling like they're ordered and have to go, but that they really want to try to resolve the conflict and work together. Um, and really are willing to listen to one another and really hear what one another has to say. Um, the guiding principles of peacemaking are respect for one another, taking responsibility for their actions, repairing relationships, and hopefully redirection back to a different path. Um, we sit in a circle like this, which is very non-hierarchical. When we do this in the court, it's a real change from the court system that they've been involved in, where one person is sitting up on high, um, and the parties don't get much of a chance to say anything. And in that sense, mediation is different too, but they're still sitting in a hierarchical group with the mediator in control at the head of the table. That's not how it is in peacemaking. And it really, the circle is very intentional to demonstrate that um, everyone's voice is, in, is of equal importance in the circle. We use stories and icebreakers um, in, to start the conversation. We value community input. Um, I know on some of our cases, some of the peacemakers have done a fantastic job of you know, helping out the parties um, that go beyond what a mediator would do, um, finding resources for the parties, and um, actually, in some cases, driving them places, and in some cases, teaching them to drive when they need to, um, helping kids, mentoring kids, and things like that, which goes way beyond what a mediator company does. Um, as far as the preparation, um, mediators, uh, don't have a lot of contact ahead of time with the parties. Um, I don't have to believe in that, but that is part of the, the role. And I know with the community centers, the same problem in terms of parties ahead of time. Uh, and screen for domestic violence when it's needed. Um, in peacemaking, I would say there's a little bit more extensive work and preparation that goes on. Um, and sometimes there are in person visits. Um, with the attorneys or with the parties ahead of time um, to really understand um, what is needed to bring the circle together and of course um, when necessary the rest of the screen has to be done with this as well. Um, setting the rules. The mediator um, sets the ground rules and really asks the participants to agree with them. Can you agree not to interrupt each other? Mediators don't often, in my experience, go much deeper than that as far as what is exactly what does respect mean to you um, and things like that. In peacemaking, I think we go much deeper in that conversation and the parties actually set the values. So we go around the circle and ask everyone you know, what they feel they need to be able to participate safely, openly in the circle. And the parties say, this is what I need from other people. This is how I want to behave in the circle. We make a list of that either in the center of the circle or on the wall. Um, in mediation, the conversation is really managed um, by the mediator um, with open-ended questions and hypotheticals that we all use as mediators. Um, in peacemaking, again, it's a little bit more fluid. The facilitator begins with some agenda questions. Um, based on the information that they have, the peacemakers have learned ahead of time, often. Um, and then the circle, part of this is part of the circle taking care of itself. They often manage and continue the dialogue um, with the support of the peacemakers and the support people there. Um, and we use a talking piece, so we're going to get to the talking piece a little bit later. The conflict is between in mediation, obviously between the parties involved in the court case or whatever their conflict is but involved in the dispute. Um, in peacemaking, um, all of the members of the circle come to be part of the conflict and understand the conflict. Um, all of those who are impacted by whatever the issue is, that includes family. Um, Yeah, with the court involvement, the court can order parties to mediation or 
another ADR process. Um, the process is conducted away from the court, and um, the part about reasonable efforts and active efforts on the bottom is um, something that is important in child welfare cases. The agency has to show that they've made those efforts um, on a case. Mediation is a good way of showing that, one way of showing that. Peacemaking um, really involves um, in a systems change in the way the court looks at cases and the way the court does business. One of the things we always say about restorative practices in peacemaking, it's not just something you do, it is really something that you are. Um, and it, it changes a way of being and a way of thinking um, for people. And that's tough in a system, <laughs> in any system. But that's something we're really trying to do at our court. Um, so parties are really asked if and why they want to participate in peacemaking um, before there's a referral to the program. Um, and it's very rare that parties are actually, I'm not saying we haven't done it occasionally, but it's very rare that parties are actually ordered to take part in this. Um, and then I think Judge Connors is probably going to talk about this, but whenever possible, the court really tries to use the same principles that we use in peacemaking to work with the parties in the court when they come before us. And, um, and the thing about reasonable efforts on the bottom of the child welfare cases. But I know one of the things that Judge Connors is really trying to do is to integrate it throughout the system. So educating the clerks at the, at the counter is something that we're looking so that when people come in to ask for help or, or file something, that the peacemakers can also use, uh, the, that the clerks can also use some of the peacemaking principles in just dealing with the public every day as we do. Um, mediation has a high rate of durability of the agreements kept. Um, I, I don't know what the statewide average is. I know on, child, on civil cases and everything any longer. I used to know that on um, child welfare cases, the, it was usually about 80% of people who are in child um, And just, this goes back to child welfare again, but there was a study done. This, this um, CDRP was involved in a pilot on child protection mediation way back in 1998, 99, early 2000s, and Michigan State University did a study on the pilot programs around the state with the CDRPs. And I think the most powerful um, result of that study was for a child welfare case that children reached permanency on those cases that went to mediation about 12 and a half months sooner, which is huge in the life of a child in foster care. We don't have final data yet on peacemaking and permanency. Um, the tribal sites that have used peacemaking have had very high settlement rates. There was um, a tribe in Alaska, the Cake tribe. They don't have a lot of data out there either because tribal courts don't look at hard data in the same way our state court systems do. But they did do a study on um, one of the tribes in Alaska that used peacemaking and they compared it to the state court system. And this was on settlement fulfillment. So their peacemaking was used on, um, I think, criminal cases or civil cases where the parties did, I think it was sentencing fulfillment, maybe, so it was on criminal cases where the parties actually, in the peacemaking, determined their own punishment and what they needed to do to repair the harm and how to settle the case. Um, and they compared the statistics of sense fulfillment, how many people actually kept their agreement in those circles compared to the state court system as to how the percentage of people that follow court orders. The peacemaking tribal site had a 98% sentence fulfillment rate. The state court system had a 22.5% <laughs> rate of people following court orders when they're ordered to do something. It makes sense, doesn't it? How, do you, how is it when somebody tells you you have to do something? Um, so, or as opposed to when you decide to do it yourself. Um, 
So I have no doubt that we can come up with similar data, but it's just too early for us. Um, I don't know if that dramatic, but that we can certainly come up with high rates. So, uh, there we go. So I didn't actually talk about the, I did, I guess I did it off, off of the PowerPoint, the fact that we use a talking piece um, in peacemaking, which is also different. You could use it in the There's no reason why you can't. I thought at first it was a little bit of a, a gimmick, and you know, I thought, what is this thing with the talking piece? Um, it's, it's fantastic. Um, the rule of the talking piece is that you don't get to speak unless you're holding the talking piece. And it can be anything. It can be um, a, a stone. It can be um, something that is important to the parties that is passed around the circle. And so in peacemaking, we begin asking questions and pass that talking piece around the circle. As we get going and the parties have their own discussion, they pass it back and forth. And they really do self-regulate with that talking piece. You know, if somebody tries to step in, they'll say, no, you don't have the talking piece right now, and that person stops. And the beauty of the talking piece is that I think when you're in a dispute, when you're in mediation or something, and you're really, you're trying to find a break where somebody takes a breath and get into the conversation, even though the mediators told you not to interrupt, how well does that always work? Mm -hmm. um, and you've got something you want to say to counter what the other person said, usually, and you want to get it in, and that's where your mind is. I'm trying to get your best argument in. You can't do that with the talking piece. You have to sit and wait, and that really forces people to have to stop and listen a little bit better to what the other side is saying, because there's no chance you're going to be able to get in there and say what you have to say. It also helps you formulate your thoughts a little bit better before that talking piece comes to you. So I, I have found in starting out with peacemaking and parties are staying, we're just kind of explaining things and going over things and parties are starting to interrupt, that we bring the talking piece in immediately sometimes and explain it. Completely stops it. It's amazing. Do you get um, participants paper and pencil so they can? They use paper and pencil? Yes. Um, I mean, mediators make notes and um, I know with peacemaking, it, the same confidentiality rules apply as really to the court um, as with mediation. So, um, you think Kathy was asking if you give the participants so that if they're thinking of what they want to say, they can write it They down. can write it down. I see. Yes, that's right. I thought you meant no taking or something. But in a way, that defeats the purpose. Mm -hmm. If they're writing down what they want to say, they're not listening. That's true. We don't actually hand out paper and pencil, but we don't stop anybody from writing. Um, but that's a good point. They can, though, if they want to, if they want to remember something. That's also something that we use a support person for, though. Um, often with the peacemaking, we offer, the DRC offers the party a support person if they don't have somebody they want to bring, which is a huge difference from mediation where everybody has to agree on the support person. We encourage people to have a support person, but sometimes people coming, depending on what the topic is, don't want to um, involve members of their family or other people who know them in this. They want to keep this private. So we offer support people, and really that is one of the functions of the support person, is to, just like going to the doctor, I always say, when you um, want to try to remember everything that's said, sometimes you do serious situation, sometimes you take someone with you. Um, to, or Stephen. <laughs> uh, sometimes you take someone with you um, to help you remember what you want to say. The support person talks to the parties ahead of time, gets to know them. They're not there to be adversarial um, or anything like that, but they're really there to be kind of a friend, to help them remember what they want to say to help them interpret what they're hearing and so on. So um, sometimes a support person, and maybe that's why people don't do it as often, even though we don't tell them they can't, um, because they have somebody there to help them remember things that they don't know. Like that. I do, as a, as a peacemaker, write things down that I want to get back to. Oh, is there a limit to how many people can participate in a session, a peacemaking session? 
poverty? How many people? Is there a limit to how many days? It really depends on the situation. So if it's a child custody <coughs> case, it's likely to be the two parents, um, or, or a child parenting time case, maybe the two parents. It may or may not be the attorneys. We sort that all out ahead of time. Um, and then they can bring a support person. There's usually a couple of circle keepers, and sometimes the circle keepers bring support people, or they bring members of their family that are part of the community that are really being affected. There was a circle, I think, last week, that some of you may have been in it, that had 19, 20 people. Yeah. On child they can be large, and they can be small. It just depends on the case. Yeah, on child protection cases, we already have a huge contingent of people that are attached to the case, social workers, mm -hmm. Usually, the attorney for the dad, attorney for the mom, attorney for the child. Um, sometimes there are other agency providers that are there. Sometimes there are multiple parents on a case who all have attorneys. So we can have very big support. Just depends. Maybe this may be jumping ahead. Forgive me if it does. Board is going to step in and change it, but 
if there is something that the court has a concern about, the court, the court can either adopt it or reject it. Or, or reject it. Yeah. But, does it happen often? And, and on that study with the mediation, really what it does is it helps the case move along more yeah. quickly and more smoothly, um, as opposed to taking it off the court record. But that's very specific to child protection cases yeah. as opposed to other cases. Judge Connors is going to do the hard work now. <laughs> I did the hard work. <laughs> So I'd like to pick up on some of these nuts and bolts and examine them a little more um, in depth. Um, and I wanted to say at the outset, Mary comes to us from uh, the Tribal Peacemaking Program in Manistee. And um, you know, one of the things I've learned, and, I'll, and I, as I get into some of these other comments, Mary, please you know, add in on this conversation. But one of the things that uh, has become clear to me is that while we have currently 567 federally recognized tribes, and because they're federally recognized, they have the ability, at least the potential, to be allowed to develop their own court systems. And so a peacemaking program that might work for the Navajo doesn't necessarily work for the Sioux or the Fox. And we have to always be really careful about the homogenization aspect. The second part we have to be very careful about is making sure this issue of appropriation or superficiality. You know, I think Susan was that was a really uh, good sort of discussion about what's this talking piece, is it gimmicky, etc. But it has a practical application that is very effective. I, I would just note that in many many communities that talking piece goes far deeper than a practical application. It certainly would never be viewed as a gimmick. But that does not mean that we can't be aware of that and learn from each other. And, um, and so the, the a community, like Mary, who comes from a program in Manistee and then down here, it looks so different. But in sharing back and forth, the beauty of the peacemaking is the creative process of it. Because um, not only the circle itself, but how a, a community decides to use it is with should be always evolving. It is not a recipe. It is not a, you know, you can't read it in a book and then now you know how to do it. And so, you know, um, all of us, when, I, when we say we've been trained in peacemaking, we've had that. Yeah. And we will never have it all in our whole life. So I do think it goes more to this, this uh, and we'll talk about why I think it is different than mediation in terms of where, what it springs out of and how it's applied. So, uh, Patrick Wilson, who some of you have met, uh, the peacemaker over in, at uh, Little River, near Manistee, uh, they currently send all of their divorce cases to peacemaking. They don't go to the judge till they've gone through peacemaking. And while there isn't always a final set agreement what they do in that is shift it and get it at least issue the, uh, the issue that's causing the conflict as opposed to the, the other person. And so by the time it then comes to the judge, at least they can talk in a respectful way about the issue. Um, Patrick Wilson, as he went to design and implement a program at Little River, went around to see tribal peacemakers who were quietly doing this in their community. One of the people that he went to and spent time with and really admired is somebody I had, Margaret and I had the chance to meet with um, this summer. His name, you might know him very, Ernie St. Germain of Wisconsin. Really incredible man, incredible. But he did a demonstration for training over at uh, Pokagon Man, and we were guests at, that really struck me that I thought was very helpful. Uh, sure. Okay. What a wonderful. Uh, they just do it like that. And he said, you know, the pleadings, when the pleadings come in, you've got these names, they tell you who's involved, and then every pleading, it doesn't matter what it is, it comes into court, it's a paper, then it looks like that. So he says to us, what is that? What is that red scribble under the names? What is it? It doesn't matter who the people are. It doesn't matter what the words are. It's always... And 
anger, yes? So the root of all conflict, the root of all conflict, always is power and control. So if you start with that understanding, that premise, no matter what the complaint is about, we understand that this anger, this conflict, is always the root of it is power and control. So you begin with the discussion, okay, all right, why? Why is it that someone feels they need to exert the control over the other to have that power? And the why underneath that why oftentimes comes, comes down to things uh, where we know that is that anger or that fear, which is most of conflict driving conflict, what is the root of that? So oftentimes we find that people who are involved have had experiences, traumatic experiences, intergenerational trauma. Children in our system, the science we now we call these adverse childhood experiences, we're able to measure those experiences. We're able to demonstrate the science that the likelihood, the more we add to those adverse childhood experiences, the greater the likelihood of health problems, problems with work, relationships, etc. And in native communities, they say once you hit three, you start to get to that borderline where there's going to be long-term effects. Once you get in four to five to six, it really dramatic. Once you're into seven, you're almost off the charts. You're getting into suicide, incarceration, all kinds of things. Yeah? So the point being is that those experiences, those memories, those negative memories, can carry with us. Now, one of the factors of the ten that can contribute, remember, we get up to four in trouble. One of those is the separation from a parent. We've already had it. So when a child comes into our system and we think we're doing this thing by removing a child, we've already added to it. We've already systemically done something to that. So some of the roots are those experiences, and we do know, if you study history, that there are two populations in this country that have had governmental policies unlike any other population. Native American, African American. One was to rid a population from the land that they belonged to and were part of and was theirs, to take it over, and the second was to provide a cheap labor source. That ripple of effect of how we approach that comes through. The second thing that affects what we have to go to in this conflict, this need for power and control, because the first really comes out of that negative fear or flight or fright, fight, you know, the, the reaction to that. But the second really we have to be honest about looking at value systems. Because in the courts, um, and this is in, when my, in our discussions and my native friends said, you know, when we talk about peacemaking in state justice systems, you have to acknowledge the difference in world views have to acknowledge the difference in what, how you perceive the world, our relationship to each other in the world, our obligations to each other in the world, the world itself. Um, and we have, and you can trace that, we have in the law this value on property um, that is paramount. And because that becomes such a huge value, it becomes the source of how we respond to conflict. One of the ways, in my experience, that I see mediation being different is that mediation doesn't usually, to the extent it could, or perhaps should, get to is that root of that conflict and the basic value that you decide, I don't need it. We get rid of that <laughs> The root of that. Yeah? So still in a mediation, it's the idea of, I'm in this conflict, we're in this conflict together, God, I hate her, and she hates me, but we've got this case, we've got this conflict that is binding us, and I want to break that chain. But I want to break that chain, but I want to make sure I have most of the chain that I get to take with me. It's not enough for me to say, have it all, I won't fight. It's not worth it. 
So the whole negotiation is over how much of that chain am I going to get, and how much can I manipulate the mediator to try to encourage it that way. So you're coming in to that situation always sort of, I know where I want to end up, and at the end of it, out of the fear or out of the uh, anxiety, I'm going to take so much of that chain because at least I know I have that. Really good facilitator. I mean, facilitators that I know in major civil cases say my role is to listen and then go back not to tell them how great their case is, but to keep pointing out how weak your case is, where you have weaknesses, so that they start to say, I need to get to that middle. You know? My point being, it's still coming out of an affirmation of a value, i.e. property, tension of property, or feeding into what we know is the root of conflict, fear. <coughs> fear of something. So, one of the ways in the world view and why values become so important and why that discussion at the beginning is peacemaking is really, and what we are trying to do is find parallels already existing in our state system in here. Peacemaking is the affirmation of positive human action. So we literally talk about aspirational goals of better selves. Ken Burns bases most of his work on Lincoln's inaugural address of what are, as Lincoln said, our better angels. When do we go to the better angels of our human self to guide us where to go? So, um, for example, our tribal state federal forum adopted the seven grandfather teachings as those aspirational values of peacemaking for our work, our Venn diagram. We have adopted them uh, because they were shared with us for our peacemaking program. Sorry, could you explain who has adopted them? What is that group? The Federal State Tribal <coughs> Forum is an uh, arm of the Michigan Supreme Court. There are 15 around the country, and they take uh, the tribal judges in that state, a number of state judges, the Supreme Court, and federal judges. And like a Venn diagram, they look at what is the cross-section, what can we learn from each other, and how can we improve justice systems collectively <coughs> within the boundaries of our state. Advisory or powerful? We're getting pretty powerful. <laughs> because um, it actually has been the, the, the group that has pushed things forward. But that group collectively have adopted it, we've adopted it. Now, Matthew Fletcher, one of the great legal scholars at MSU, talks, and he does work with uh, tribes all over uh, the country. Many other tribal courts have used these seven grandfather teachings with Mishnabe in some form, um, and many are borrowing from that. What are the seven grandfather teachings? Well, that's what we're going to go for. <laughs> That's going to talk about worldview and why I get into it. So, one of the things when it comes into conflict, the big, a really important thing is to break like that. Just throw that away for a minute and set the stage, if you will. To separate that. One um, way to do that, actually, as I was thinking about it last night, came to me in the middle of the night, so I'm going to share it because it fits into this. And one way is you're sitting down is to start talking about, you know, we're in this room, all of us, and if we just quietly sit down and imagine ourselves for a minute, that if we just rise above this room, so suddenly, just a little bit above us, we can no longer see ourselves locked in this room. But we see the parking lot, we see the jail, we see 23, we keep going a little bit higher, we start to see our county. Go a little higher, we start to see Canada on the one side and the border. We keep going higher, we see the two peninsulas. The higher, we see the North America and higher. We start to see South America increasing, we see the world. And we just hold that image in our head, because that's the reality. If we think about that, now we are all like little ants, buried in our little hole, fighting with each other over this little space. But the reality is we're all just, uh, I guess, hurtling through space. And all that we need is here. You know, we 
have water on this planet. Our bodies are primarily water, something like 90 percent water. We have food that comes out of the earth, the air that we breathe is a symbiotic relationship. We breathe in the oxygen, we breathe out, we breathe out the carbon dioxide, the trees breathe in the carbon dioxide and turn it back into oxygen. And this goes back then to this concept of worldview of we are connected, we are guests, this notion of property, of ownership, that I get more and I, and I value my success as a human being of how many of those chains can I get in my pile mm -hmm. as opposed to you. University of Michigan Law School, pretty good law school, has told me, and I really applaud them for this, they've made a conscious decision, those of us who trained as lawyers, we spend the entire first year, require class, everything builds off of property. <laughs> we spend the whole year, the law is about property and then things develop off of that. The University of Michigan Law School has made a conscious decision, they are no longer requiring that as a so that kind of rethinking that sort of parallel. So, if we think about the world, we start with that idea that in the morning, you know, some comes up at ease, right? And, and it's more than just the pretty sunrise. We think about the fact we're whirling around in space. Without that sun, we're dead. That sun goes when all gone. It is over. So that sun is that constant reminder of that gift. I'm here for you. I'm here for you. So we come up into the east, and this is a little bit different, Mary, because of some of the incorporation that we've done in this particular one. But we come up, the first thing, the idea of how we are in the world, and we look at the east, one of the grandfather teachings that we've ascribed to that, it starts with respect. Because it's that idea of that respect of this truth going around at all times. And that therefore, really, we begin with respect for, for guests on this planet, and we go from there. And then if we look at, as the, high, as the sun hits the high of the day, and this is the beginning of all things, we come into birth, we come in through water, through our mothers, we're born, we're helpless, we come into the south, yeah, high noon, youth, and that one is really based in love. Now, I think this is one of the values that is the most important value in many ways in peacemaking. And it's been reminded to us, I saw yesterday, that uh, President Obama had three of the top ten retweets last year. Current occupant had none. <laughs> I only say this because it's the power of that. And the power of the number two was Mandela's. We are not born hating another person because of the color of their skin or their religion or where they are from. If we can be taught to hate, we can learn to love. And he says, because love is the more natural basis of the human heart. I believe it. I believe it. But so that's why we talk about that in youth and growing up. And then we get to the West, and that's another set of grandfather teaching. The West so when the sun sets at the end of our day or at the end of our kind of careers, and that is bravery. That concept that no matter what the cost is, the courage to stand up. When we come around to the north, at nighttime, we look above. That one is wisdom. Okay? That's at the end of our years. You and I, we we're wearing the mark, aren't we? We're getting close, giving back to the little ones. But that's just us in the physical plane. And on the spiritual plane, if we look up above from above, this idea of the sun, it feeds us all, gives us warmth, but also we can't have plant life without Without plant life, we don't have food, right? That's from above, and below is Mother Earth. And one of the values that's been looked at, wisdom, by the way, it's in the north, look above, honesty, the idea that at all times if we are just honest about the situation, it's far less painful than if we start to try to avoid that. We always have to deal with to deal within ourselves. So a lot of peacemaking talks about these being aspirational values of saying, 
worry less about whether Susan Butterworth's being very honest right now. Okay. How honest are you being? You go back into yourself, you open yourself, and you put that into the circle, your action will demonstrate and the other part will come around. Down below is humility. Your feet on the ground, the idea that your head starts to tell you how powerful they are if we look at that really aren't so much. We have this sort of thing spiritually coming and then you're within. It's who you are. Your spiritual being inside the human body. Your spiritual beings have a human experience, not vice versa. And then, we all have a mother and a father. I mean, it takes these two biological things. Within us, we are here because there is the seed from a father and there is the nourishment from a mother. We have male and female inside of us. We are all two spirits. You know, all this hullabaloo about Michigan accepting same-sex marriages, we've been doing it in this state for years. The tribal courts have long recognized. They just laughed at us. Are you kidding? Of course. So we have this other part of the male and the female. And this bed becomes sort of who we are. You see, it's the basic atom, it's the basic structure of all living things. All of us in our form are some recomposition of these same elements. And when we die, we go back into the earth and we come back in other sorts of forms. So that becomes our connectedness. Um, <coughs> this is why relationships become uh, the bright line, Joe. If we look at a case and we say, after whatever label's put on, because when we show that pleading, you got the black and pleading and all the anger in it, one guilty, not guilty, right? You know, negligent, not negligent. Custodial parent, non custodial parent. Parental rights terminated, non terminated. It doesn't matter what the label is. If after that's done, and that thing goes out there, just like I just did. Those people in the red still have to deal with each other. We're all standing here saying, man, I took care of that case, didn't we? Yeah. We got rid of that. Look how fast <laughs> we did that. And that's just fomenting that now. So if there's going to be ongoing relationships, I don't care what category the type of case it is. Criminal, civil, family. Peacemaking should be a presumptive beginning. And only if the imbalance of the individuals the attorney sometimes you can do something about, but only if after some work they just aren't there. We have a default position to manage that conflict already in place. We already have a system that will do that. Sure. If I'm, I, I don't, I don't disagree at all with anything that you put up there. And, um, but if, if I if I were to accept the truth of that, at least in my experience as a as a mediator, and I do a lot of domestic uh, by desire, um, you would throw all the domestic relations cases into peacemaking and you would not mediate them because we get a lot of them resolved, but there are ongoing relationships where control, uh, power are still very much at play. There's a lot of fear. They're, they're, they've got a long way to go in repairing relationships and getting to the level that you're talking about here. Right. If, if, you're, if, if they're going to heal, and more importantly, if they're going to be a, a, a positive influence going forward on the children, which are right. most important. Well, that's what Little River, River does. They put all in. Now, whether they all get to that transformative stage? No. Do all of us as individuals mm -hmm. do that? No. Do we sometimes ebb in and out like a circle? Sometimes we do pretty well, then we kind of fall back into old patterns? Yes. Is the potential always there? Absolutely. Absolutely. Sometimes you'll see that healing occur in the next generation when suddenly grandbabies start coming along and everybody goes, oh, I guess maybe we could do this a little differently. So I agree with you, there are kinds of cases where that makes sense. The greatest pushback comes in the criminal area. Why? This is my view. My wife's an ex-prosecutor, so she agrees with me on this point. All you have to do is sort of look at the, the rhetoric of fear, right? It divides us. It's this notion that we need to be there because in the middle of the night, the police is going to come through the door and do terrible things to you. 
and all of that stuff gets fed in. And we have, you know, 5% of the world's population and 25% of the incarcerated population. When I look around, my fellow Americans, we are much different. I don't think we're necessarily any more criminal than anybody else. But we've created this huge machine. And human beings become a kind of a property. So there, we have the biggest pushback there. Family, I think they actually, most families, other than like you'll get someone who says, I want this power control and I want the theater, the courtroom, to humiliate this person I'm angry with. That we can stop, but most people in their hearts know that that's, they much rather have that, this sort of a format to deal with that conflict than that. And I think a lot of civil, I mean, we just did one, another one. Uh, Susan was been involved in a really, case in the living too, weren't you, to some extent. Where uh, the nightmare for both, all of us, uh, community not far from here. One son's home from college, he's developed a drinking problem, he supposedly is in rehab, he tells his dad he's going out the door to rehab, it turns out he is stone cold drunk, he crosses the center line, and he kills two young people in the community. And he goes, he's in prison now, but there's anger about all that, not being able to talk about it. And now it was the civil case that was coming. And the lawyers said, this, you know, no, this trial's going to tear this fam these families up again. And there isn't any, you know, there's a limited amount of money. Somehow we've got to advance this forward that they can move on. And they did that in circle, but at least they were able to the two others were actually able to hug at the end, whereas before they wanted to each strung up. You know. So I think um, its application, there's no doubt in my mind and that it is working, it's being picked up elsewhere. Alaska, the Supreme Court in Alaska actually created a, a Supreme Court rule where they can send their state color, uh, cases to the tribal courts for sentencing circles. Um, we are talking about that here because if another state can do it, why can't we do it here? Um, we, the, one of the shifts that's happening is a couple of things. Um, the Supreme Court announces, decides the leadership for each county's court system every two years. And they have made the decision and publicly announced it so I can share it, that a year from now, beginning January 1st, 2019, Judge Carol Kunke will be our new chief judge. And I think anticipating will be our chief judge for some time. She is very open. Like me, she came to this not to, to the bench, not from a criminal background. She came to it from a civil background. Um, she sees the wisdom in some of these approaches. She's particularly interested in developing a program uh, with peacemaking, and that was I've been authorized to bring this up to you. For because judges we know from the science of the brain development, particularly young males, they don't really mature until about age 25. Yet, their actions, we, ex we judge them, and we expect them to behave like adults. We don't have, judges don't have any control of whether a charging agency decides to charge them as an adult or not. There are some statutory deferment programs, though, in uh, Holmes Youthful Training Act, HIDA, that are out there. The problem is, is that even if they're given that because of this lack of development, because of, of the lack of support, oftentimes these kids that are charged have been severely traumatized themselves, and they're sort of told, you need to go do this, a lot like our child welfare doctor with parents. You need to go do this on such and such a date, report into me, otherwise we're going to violate you, and it's gone. So she is very interested in, in that juvenile charged as adult population in this county doing the test cases to see. If they've been put on probation post-sensing, how do we help them manage and get through probation successfully so it isn't just a screw-up? So I think that has great potential, and I'm hopeful. Uh, I'm really glad we have a judge thinking like that. Mm -hmm. I'm hopeful we can work on that. Uh, first, Janelle, then Joe. Okay. I have a question about... Um, I have a question about when the prosecutor is making a decision to the two adult court, is there anything like the general public can do, like can write a letter? No. Or can't so post-sentencing is the judge's prerogative. So this notion of, great, the legislature has already said you have these 
possibilities. We as a community, it seems to me, ought to be doing everything we can to make sure that that youth doesn't get a, swept up a screw up on it for lack of understanding or support. Which is exactly my question. Is there any consideration of a concept of uh, used in Canada very successfully, which is uh, called a COSA a circle of uh, support and accountability, a circle of the of the people who uh, can who manage this youth and also can help them surrounding them during that period when we want them up No, I don't think there is, uh, other than what Alaska is sort of basically doing that by sending it to the tribal courts and theirs. That's why I think that we would have this potential to do something here with a part of a population with the support. Uh, I am, I, I know the can, can, Canadians are ahead of us on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. One of them is the Truth and Reconciliation hearings. And we're working with them, actually. But they're interested in what we're doing in peacemaking and bringing broad into the state courts. And so we're, there's some discussion about really looking at that in a broader sense. But I, my point of all this, Joe, is this would be the first inroad I would see, truly see in the criminal justice system that I'm even aware of if we could start to bring that to that population. And it's hard not, it's hard, well, um, if you already have a legislature saying this person should be on probation and the judge has uh, the discretion to figure out what does that mean in, in ultimate violation. Um, Judge Cookie, for example, is more interested in saying, in terms of your probation, you just get a GED, not the fines and costs. Mm -hmm. you know? So you see, we start to talk about what does that mean and some of these principles and how do these circles help support that? I think that'd be an admirable thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something that, that, uh, that really should come from the community rather than the Department of Correction. Department of Corrections could certainly, we might have to do a report, but I think what we have to develop is an additional report, an additional thing from the community about this youth to that judge to decide if there's an allegation of that violation of probation or what should be terms of probation. How do you better yourself as opposed to the punitive aspect? I'm sorry. So I have a fundamental question, basically. But All right. what I'm trying to say is where did the concept of uh, hiding crime come? From it's only 20 years old. Why don't we? Why can't we get rid of it fundamentally in our society? What's this bit of heaven to be hard and crime? You know, three strikes and out. All of that is new. Can we change our society and just question those fundamental values? They are not our values. They have never been our values. They've been imposed upon us over the last 20, 30 years. Let's just get rid of them. The article I gave to you, uh, this Judge Avenatti is sort of the senior judge that's in this film, Tribal Justice. Um, there are, there's an a interfaith group and some others that are putting on this film um, at the, for the public. I've seen that. And, and the, but they're going to put it on and then another talking session afterwards and we're having Ottawa Seppi come. I think that um, that's a, one of the reasons I feel so strongly that um, in that film, for example, one of the families that's followed is an individual who was in and out of the foster care system, starts using drugs, gets nailed with that, is in the adult prison system, he's on the three strikes and you're out. And for the first time ever, because the Yurok tribe didn't, didn't, wasn't even recognized, they didn't even have a court till, excuse me, 2007, yet Judge Avenatti, Yurok, came in and said, we're going to do Yurok justice. You can call it whatever you want, you can call it restorative justice. You can call it peacemaking. We don't care. We're going back to our value system. That Taoist Proctor is, is one example of that. And then even young fellow Isaac, who um, ends up, they're not able to help him. He's currently in the prison system. Still, the question becomes could he have been helped better early on? Mm -hmm. Or, like Taoist Proctor, after a stint in the adult prison system, will he return back to his community and go from there? And then, of course, that whole ICWA case with a child where she looks to the state for help and they take her child for two years, she has to fight to get him back. So I think that the, your answer to that is the awareness and the demand, but I think I think this film can help us and I think I think a lack of fear to try what's there to lose in trying to help a kid on probation? Exactly. If he fails, he fails. 
why would you be afraid of anybody trying to help them? Why would you be afraid of a community trying to say, look, you need to get your GED. What's the problem? How do we get, how do we handle it? So, huh. so um, uh, I work with a friend who runs a prison reentry support group out of Jackson County, of Jackson, Michigan, and they have restorative justice circles with people who are incarcerated for major violent crimes, and the people that um, were victims of those of those crimes, whether they're surviving victims or victims themselves. And I was wondering if any of that was happening in Washington County, this post-sentencing restorative healing work for the community. Linda was Linda was and I are serving on a board. I think we went to the board meeting Monday. I think there is a group that wants to look at that. Um, I will only say this. My personal uh, experience has been outside of the criminal justice system, but here's my experience why I think it would apply to the criminal justice system, is an issue of trust. When you are already yanked into a system where you're being labeled and you have this holding over your head and the power and control is really holding you, the restorative proposal should not come from the person that's holding this over your head. So the more that we involve people in the community, outside of the judge, outside of the charging agency, et cetera, I think it's great if they say, we support this and we'll give our resources. But I think you really need to let that be back in with the community. Give back in. You still have the power to say, I'm sorry, we reject this recommendation for these reasons. <clears throat> but I don't see any reason to be afraid of it. I, I'll, can I add yeah. that, um, so we don't have anything set up like that, uh, that mirrors what is happening in Jackson and some other places in Michigan, because uh, our primary stakeholders are not all on board, but I think uh, there are baby steps being taken to, to shift, hopefully to shift that, at least start the conversations about how do we shift that as a community. Um, and that is happening in Washtenaw County. So if we wanted to look at what's happening here versus some Jackson and a, a couple other counties in the state, we are at that very beginning infancy stage yeah. of trying to. I just I think it's interesting direction. because what's happening in Jackson is through a nonprofit agency that works yeah. with, directly with the prison. If they bypass the, <clears throat> the judges and the prosecutors all together because mm -hmm. they're not on board there with any sort of alternative mm -hmm. resolution. <laughs> but here in Washtenaw County, it seems that the um, that every <coughs> That it's much, people are much more open to alternative dispute resolution in general. But I don't, I mean, I don't know if that, that's just what it seems like. It's it's an, I think it's a mixed bag. I think we have a lot of community members that are very open to alternative dispute yeah. resolution, restorative justice, um, very specifically. But when we talk about you know, working, so in Jackson you have the Jackson prison, you have yeah. the prisons are yeah. located in Jackson, right. so that's part of you know why they can work around that. But here we have to work with our stakeholders, which would be the prosecutor, law enforcement, and those kinds of folks on the criminal side. And there's efforts being made now to start getting to the table with them on, you know, what this conversation and what this could look like. And we're just keeping at it, basically. So that's where we are. I'm suggesting that there needs to be a concurrent path opened in it. Where I also see it in the civil area is institutional mm -hmm. players, mm -hmm. the university. The Michigan Hospital, or you know, anybody, or the insurance company, anybody who has a lot of litigation or, or a lot of resources, Ford Motor Company. I mean, I'm just, you know, I'm not, I'm not. So if you have, the, if you have the power, the financial power, you're going to be loath to give up that advantage when you walk into court. So that's one of the other things, and the way we have to shift that is somehow start to shift that idea of saying, you know, this issue is going to keep coming back up. You may view this in a purely monetary sense, and that's okay. But because there's going to be this ongoing relationship, you may start to think about the fact that you can protect yourself better behaving a different way and being open to it. So we're seeing a, a real drop in, in, for example, University of Michigan Hospital started to see the wisdom of that. So when someone dies, they sit down and they apologize. <laughs> They start with the apology, like, you know, we're sorry. And many, many cases just start with there as, in, as opposed to immediately, well, we didn't do anything wrong, and how dare you? You know about that, Kathy, don't you? Well, I just heard that it was a big cultural change to get doctors to be able to say, yeah. because they didn't want to be culpable. Right. But it's, 
when they finally started saying it, they realized that, that people didn't want to prosecute them. <laughs> they just wanted to hear it and say, I'm sorry. Yes. And well, even we've had it, we've used that piecemeal where it's even come in later. And once we finally have used that, even post after all that litigation, the trouble with the litigation it keeps adding to that. You're angry when setting a pleading and a mischaracterization, then they're really angry. And then they want that day to sort of be exonerated or the other one familiar. So each step makes it harder to get back to, to that at the beginning. And then it was using the hospital as an example, they've also, um, in these models of restorative systems, and it, it's the budget really reflects the values as well, right? Because right. you need to put resources where the resources are needed. And one of the things that they added were staff to help mitigate that. How, who talks to the doctor and those, you know, conversations to help them come along to get to that place where that apology can be given. Um, and some prep, some pre work is done, so it's not, you know, dumping on the doctor or whatever the case may be. Um, so I, I, to their credit, they didn't just say we're going to move to this approach, and you must say you're sorry. They put some resources in place to help people move in that direction, and that's that it creates the systems change. I believe you have to have, you know, real dollars to back real resources. To, to move things. And so all of that is a part of this larger conversation in Washington County. How can we create this alternative path for juveniles and for the, our criminal justice system, adult and juvenile? I mean, over the week on Friday, three kids were arrested and they were in a juvenile court on Monday. Um, 13, two 13s, 16, one 13, 16. And a young girl who is 11 are going to be charged with felonies and as adults. Um, no. Well, they haven't made the decision to charge them still. The hearing actually starts at 1 30 today. Um, and that's why I was asking because it's just, to me, it was very hard to sit in there um, and see these boys, um, you know, while out over the weekend for whatever reason. They have their reason. But to then charge them, to consider charging them as adults, one of the sentences, um, two of the two of the charges rather than carry a maximum of life sentence. Oh my God. Uh, and it's just kind of like, there's got to be something else that we can do in some other way. And so that's why I was asking this, for someone to write a letter or grab somebody in the hallway or something to, um, you know, just kind of, Know, give, like because it's such a machine, nobody takes the time to stop and look at what am I doing? Why am I doing this? Like, yeah, the charge is X, Y, and Z, but you know, one of the boys in the court it came out like his mother had passed away. Another boy um, was playing sports, and his sports ended. So was that his reason? Another boy has other problems that are are longer, and I'm like, do they even do like a safety valve on the? Is before they decide to charge them as adults, like you know, to maybe see where they are mentally, maybe something was going on to have them acting this way. Um, and, and the three boys, it was in one situation incident, but the little girl was a domestic dispute. She had an argument with her mom and threw an object in the home. Mom called the police, and they're charging her with a felon. And uh, you know, eleven-year-old girl who had a, a little girl who had a fight with her mother. Come on now. I mean, and I don't know all the details. I know what happens, but I'm so glad I'm, my mother didn't call the police on me. But <laughs> um, but this is what's happening. I, I just brought that up to say that these are the realities that that are happening right now as we sit here. Something is happening to kids and. These um, opportunities for apology within the hospital context or otherwise, are, are these all occurring within uh, absolute confidentiality contexts, like like mediation, so that yeah, uh, one is certain there are there are, there are no adverse legal repercussions from a from yeah. apology. I don't know the details. I know Rick Boothman. You probably know Rick and. Um, you know, Ebert, I think, is over there now. So they just paid it. it they actually, I understand, they, we, we had, a, I had a trial that went the full route, and they came in pretty heavy and got whacked. And it caused them to sort of rethink things. 
and I've taught them for that. And, uh, you know, this doesn't work with every case, but it's a healthier approach. Joe, I remember when they came here and spoke at a brown bag lunch, the University of Michigan Hospital talked about their change. One of the things they said is that they, they have uh, encouraged doctors to say, I'm sorry that you feel this way about what happened. Um, something like that that doesn't admit guilt in the beginning when they haven't decided that they really are guilty, but they do an apology for the impact on the person much more articulately. Yeah, than but, that's a, but that's a, well, it was, that's a half-assed apology. I mean, I, but but I, I, the way I did it was, but the way they said it was not, it was, it was a, you know, it was the, the impact on the person, whether or not the hospital was guilty, is still there. And so they apologized for that impact. And then after they investigated, they found out whether or not there was responsibility for the doctor to apologize for their behavior, actually. There's a fear of, this is the fear behind the truth and reconciliation. Nobody wants to talk about it because they're afraid it will create some kind of liability. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you have to be able to kind of acknowledge the truth of things and not pretend stuff didn't happen. I mean, I, you know, where that goes from there, I can't see that as being a negative. I'd like to talk just quickly on resources. I am pleased. It's a small step, but it's still a small step in the right direction. So our contract view of the court, which is primarily for this neglect and abuse area, a little bit of the, of the domestic, um, that was uh, reimbursed half by the state. The state has chosen not to accept peacemaking as a reimbursable item. And we tried to fight the good fight of why that made no sense, but, you know, their first trip. So um, our county, our county commissioner and our county administration did say we'll honor the contract going forward. We'll make up the difference. So we have that in place, which is good because one of the goals of institutionalizing peacemaking is institutionalizing the you know, budget allocated towards it. Uh, and not be dependent on grant or other forms of reimbursement to take it out. It is a small step, but it's an important step, and I'm very hopeful um, it can be revisited in April. Um, so what I'm really hopeful is that if we start to expand our need, is great, our ability to utilize, you know, the DRC as a resource, as Susan Butter we can go back into the hearing, you know, we, we have battles, we got to fight to get that extended. But we'll make a headway on that, and my hope is then the budget will increase. So that was sort of a. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. If, if you have any suggestions for continuing education for the peacemakers in this group, yes. we would love to have some direction on that. I'd like to, I, I would really love for you to come to the showing of this film. Those of you that you've seen, I've seen it six times. I've seen some of every time. Um, January 23rd is a Tuesday night. And then the following Thursday will be a discussion, and uh, Chairman Mandoka will be there from Nato Sepi and others. And this other group is very interested in this work. So, what we need to do is keep bringing like minded people together. Uh, in the fall, um, uh, there's Work to bring actually bring Judge Avenatti out for a follow up, and so you you know this is where I think uh, at the university. So I think the more that we familiarize ourselves with that and start to develop uh, the recognition that what can be done that's being done nationally, those connections um, of those tribal state federal forums I told you about, and and the discussions that are happening with the Canadians. Michigan is viewed as a real leader for various reasons. New Mexico, uh, California, where this Judge Avenatti is a co-chair, and then kind of Alaska, uh, Oregon, Washington. So, you know, to move the discussion forward and to make recommendations for institutional change, I think is going to come primarily out of these travel state federal forums because they cross over. And, um, and they were they they are all they are all there as a result of a Supreme Court, the state Supreme Court saying these have value, we, we feed it, we believe in it, and it's more than just discussion, it's actually starting to propose uh, ways of doing things differently. So I just want to add that we're on the 
this the film is going to be at U of M. The, tribal Justice. The Tribal Justice out of the U of M group. I think we're on their radar to receive any flyers or invitations to that so that we can fan it out. I spoke to someone with who's yeah. organizing that event. Yeah, yeah. there's a so fellow. So we can get share that information. What I'll do with is I'll just include you right into the emails I have with them. I had to confirm uh, getting someone from out of a session. They haven't set up, but I, they set up the date. So I'll okay. include you right now. Okay. So thank you so much. Well, thank you.